Let's, let's, this is kind of an age test. Uh, how many were alive when Martin Luther King Jr. was alive? Let's see. You know, I didn't realize, you forget, I didn't realize he was 39 years old when his life was uh, taken from him. And uh, so I won't ask how many of you are already older than he was because we won't, we, won't, we won't tempt you to lie in the house of God. Uh, but I just went back and, and re-listened to the speech, I Have a Dream. And you know, it was astonishing how much that speech was interwoven with Scripture. Because all the best plans for human beings from, come from the heart of God. And he was a man who was willing to stand up and say it in his generation. It cost him greatly. How many are grateful that every generation has people who will stand up and declare the good things of God for the people of God? Amen? So we're very grateful. I know that's uh, kind of a bittersweet day. And a lot of us wonder what he might yet have accomplished if he had more days. We're very grateful for what he did accomplish with the days that he had. We are in the book of Daniel this morning, and we are continuing our series on prayer. And uh, this is a really interesting situation that develops in the life of one of the most impressive people in all of the Old Testament. It says, in the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last how long? Seventy years. years. How many think 70 years is a long time to wait for something? How many doesn't have that much time left to wait for something? Okay. And so I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer, in petition, in fasting, in sackcloth, and in ashes. Now for time, we're not going to read through the next set of verses of Scripture. We're going to jump ahead. But in between, he acknowledges God's greatness. He admitted what their failures had been. He identified what had been the natural consequences and side effects of their behavior, and he reminded himself of the incredible things God had done to bring Israel out of the land of bondage. And then he picks up with this passage. He says, now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Now, the, the, the words that are in yellow and bold, would you read these out loud and let's declare it authoritatively in the house this morning. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. It's a great passage of Scripture. We talked last week about this concept of almost like a, a mini spiritual vacation, where devotional prayer can give us a break from the hurry of life, the worry of life, and the guilt of life. But this is not the only kind of prayer that exists in Scripture. In fact, there are many kinds of prayer in Scripture. We know this because it tells us in Ephesians, or in, in uh, 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 Ephesians the sixth chapter, that there are all kinds of prayer that we can engage in. So I went and I did a little research, uh, starting with the book of uh, Acts, to see what kinds of prayers exist in addition to praying for uh, uh, salvation or, or praying for um, just the things that we would uh, talk about today. And looks into the things that are included in prayer. They prayed to identify leadership, to receive the Holy Spirit, to prepare and equip those being sent on a mission, to receive something to share with others, to bring someone back from the dead. How many think that's a bold prayer? How many have been praying that prayer lately? Yeah. Uh, for release of an imprisoned leader. They prayed 
to offer praise to God. They prayed to avoid disaster. They prayed for healing. They prayed for uh, others to come to faith in Christ. They prayed for safety. They prayed to interpret spiritual language. They prayed for restoration. They prayed for strength, for stability, for fruitfulness. They prayed uh, for victory in spiritual warfare. They prayed for an opportunity to clear the gospel. They prayed for maturity. They prayed for assurance. They prayed to see each other again. They prayed to be delivered from wicked people. They prayed for civil leaders. They prayed for help. They prayed to live honorably in every situation. They prayed to get out of trouble. They prayed to recover from sinful behavior. And they prayed for health and prosperity. How many? That's a lot of things to pray for. It really is. And I don't think that's all the things to pray for. I don't think that's intended to be a, a final list. So we have some questions to ask ourselves today, and I think they're very important questions. Are Christians supposed to accept all things as God's will? Are Christians supposed to accept all things as God's will? Some Christians do believe that everything has been predetermined and predecided. And we're basically witnesses of this incredible drama that God is, has written and is being played out throughout human history. But the question I have is, if everything is predetermined, if everything is predecided, then what purpose does prayer have? What are we supposed to pray about if it's already been decided? And there are some people who would say, well, we should pray for wisdom and understanding to know what God is doing in the situation and pray for strength to be able to endure the situation. But they wouldn't necessarily argue that we should pray to change the situation. So is there any room for believers to pray for a miracle, for God to change a situation supernaturally, or to overrule what seems to be the rule in a situation. And what we just discovered in that litany of things that people prayed about in the New Testament is that they prayed about many things. You see, we can pray for more than just wisdom and discernment. We can pray for more than just strength to endure. And we can pray for more than forgiveness of sins. That God actually is very interested in our lives. And he wants to assist us in facing the challenges that we are before us and to carry the burdens that we have upon us. And so God comes to actually help us. Is it appropriate to pray for a miracle? I believe that it is. In fact, I believe prayer is how God's will is released in our world. Prayer is how God's will is released in our world. Let me explain this. There are some people who think that everything is already God's will, but if that's true, then why did Jesus teach us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, heaven is a place where God's will is always done. That's what makes it heaven. And earth is a place where God's will still needs to be done. And that's how we know it's a broken world. How many already figured it out? This is not heaven. <laughs> Just poke the person next to you and tell them, this is not heaven. Maybe your life is really good. Heaven's even better, all right? Now, here's the challenge. Sometimes God takes time to answer prayer. Sometimes God takes time to answer prayer. Daniel comes to understand that God is going to do something, but it's going to take 70 years before God's people are going to be returned to their homeland or the city of Jerusalem is going to be restored and that Israel becomes a nation again. He is not going to see this in his lifetime. He's never going to see it. And he does something that is astonishing. He prays for something he will never see because he won't live long enough to see it. That is a very interesting thing. You see, sometimes we limit the definition of faith is to say that it is our belief that God can do something, but Daniel shows us it is belief that God is doing something. He is at work even if we do not see all the details 
even if we will not see the final outcome. And what uh, we need to understand is when you do that, it keeps you from becoming discouraged. Prayer is actually, in, in, in this kind of relentless praying keeps us from despair. Now, uh, there are lots of people who can be discouraged about what they're going through. But my experience has been when you take what you're going through and you add prayer to it, even if you don't see immediate change, something does change in your heart. You find the capacity to bear up under the challenge and to look with hope to what God is yet going to do in that situation. It tells us in Ephesians, the third chapter, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. How many are glad God can do more than you ask or more than you can imagine? I can imagine some pretty big stuff. I have a vivid and active imagination, and God can do more than what I come up with. Why is that important for us to know? Well, long-term goals actually require relentless prayers. There are things that are way out in the distance, and what we need to know is we need to stay engaged. It's not just consistent prayer like devotions where we're taking a break from the demands of life, but relentless prayer where we're pursuing some long-term goals in life. So what is God doing while he's taking time? I mean, I've, I don't know how you talk to God, but I've actually said things like this to God. God, come on. Hurry up. You created the whole universe in six days. I've been waiting longer on this than that. Has anybody else ever prayed like that? You will if you haven't. And here's what I want you to see. Sometimes God is at work in timing. Timing. There are things that he is coordinating. There are things that he is bringing together. There are other people and other situations that can be benefited by his answer to your prayer, and he wants them included. And so he's working that together so that this can be worked out. So he is at work in the timing. He's also at work in our growing. See, there are still things to learn. There are still ways we can mature. There's still wisdom that we can access, and God wants us to grow and to mature. And God is at work in terms of revealing his glory. Now, I know maybe you would say, doesn't that sound a little egotistical? Does God always have to get the credit for everything that he does? Does he always have to sign his work of art? Why can't he do something incognito? Why can't he do something anonymous? And this is what I want you to know. Most of the work of God is done incognito and anonymous. When we get to heaven, we're going to see how much the fingerprints of God was all over our lives. And we didn't even know. But it is also true that in our world, there are many people who misunderstand who God is and misunderstand God's heart towards them. They see him as some kind of an angry father or an angry judge who's just looking for a reason to punish anyone. I knew a father who used to walk into his children's home every day when he'd come home from work and he would say this, what have you done that I can beat you for today? And there are some people who see God like that. In fact, they will interpret every bad thing that happens in their life as judgment from God because they misunderstand God. And God can actually take situations and by our willingness to be patient with him will help other people come to a better standing of him. Don't we want other people to know as much about God as we do? Don't we want him to know, them to know that he is gracious and he is loving and he is kind and he is for them. That's what God wants to do. So waiting doesn't mean that God is not working. He's not finishing up another project and then he'll get to us. God is at work in all of our situations. And he will do things that will benefit us, even though we cannot see it. Sometimes we pray for things that are far away. We'll pray for someone that maybe is on the other side of the world and will never even see what God does in their lives. And we still pray for them even though it's far away. And sometimes we pray for things 
that are afar off. Maybe it won't happen in our generation or in our lifetime, but wouldn't it be wonderful to participate in what God is going to do in the future of our families, of our church family, of our nation, and in our world? When was the last time you prayed for something that was beyond your lifespan? That's a very powerful prayer to attack. That's a very bold prayer to pray. So I'd like to give you a couple of strategies for relentless praying because what I will tell you is this is not easy. Relentless praying is not easy. So here's a couple of strategies. Don't be afraid to add body language to your prayer language. Don't be afraid to add body language to your prayer language. What do I mean by that? For lots of people, prayer is really nothing more than a thought process. And what I will tell you, if you view, if you view religion as the primary obligator of behavior, then that's all it really ever has to be is just, you. Th I think, certain thoughts and that's enough. But let's just check. How many married people do we have in the room today? Okay. And uh, how many know that just thinking good thoughts about your spouse is not enough? Like at the end of the week, your spouse comes to you and says, you haven't talked to me, you haven't touched me, you haven't kissed me, you haven't hugged me, we haven't spent any time together, we didn't do anything together, what's with that? And they look at you and say, oh, it's okay, I thought good things about you. And we would go, yeah, that, that, that doesn't work. And how often do we think that our spiritual life is just a mental exercise? You know, uh, when our nation was being formed, there was a religious body that were uh, very popular at the time. They still exist. They were called the Quakers. And the Quakers used to do this thing where they would, they would take their hands and they would turn them upside down. They would, and they, when they did that, what they were telling God is there are things that they were releasing, that they were letting go of, that they didn't want to hang on to anymore. They would turn their hands over and they would confess their sins and let them go. They would turn their hands over and they would confess their fears and release them. They would turn their hands over. Here's one to try. Turn their hands over and tell God, I'm not trying to control this situation any longer. I want to put you in control of it. That's a pretty bold prayer, isn't it? And then sometimes they would take their hands and they would turn them upwards because there are things they needed to receive from God, things that they were lacking, things that they did not have. So they turned their hands up because they needed peace that they didn't currently have, or they needed grace to help them get through a situation, or they needed forgiveness because they had failed, or they needed spiritual gifts to be released in their life and the life of their uh, spiritual community so that God's grace would be known by all, or they needed provision in certain areas where there were insufficiency. It, sometimes they would just take their hands and in prayer they would turn them over for the things they were letting go and turn them up for the things that they are receiving. And this is a good way to add body language to your prayer language. And by the way, there's other things that we can do. How many have ever heard of kneeling? I, Americans don't kneel. You know, if, if you were raised in a country where there was a monarch, you kneel or you bow or you curtsy. We're Americans. We don't kneel. We don't bow. God knows we don't curtsy. We don't do that. And um, when a person would kneel before a monarch, what they were saying is, I recognize your authority over my life. I recognize that you have the right to determine the direction of my life. You are my king, my sovereign. You are in control. And there is something very powerful, even in our own prayer time, it's, it's something that is counterintuitive to the American culture. We're not raised to do this, but you can still do it. And that is especially in relentless prayers where you just bow your knee and tell God, I trust you to be a loving and kind king. I trust your will and I trust your ways. And I want you to know I acknowledge your control of my life. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. So you can add body language to prayer language. Here's another thing that you can do. You can put prayer on the menu. You can. In Daniel 10, it says that Daniel altered his diet 
in order to influence his prayer. So it says, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. All right, I'm going to ask you to do math. How many days is three weeks? Very good, 21 days. And it says, I ate no choice food, no meat, no wine touched my lips, and I, I used no lotion for those 21 days. What's going on here? Well, throughout the history of people who have followed God, there have been times when things were more important to them than the food that they were eating. And throughout history, people who have followed God, it's not been uncommon that they would, instead of eating a meal, devote that time to prayer. And the, the most common length of, uh, the, the practice is called fasting, the most common length of fasting is just a 24-hour time period. Most Christians throughout histories uh, have started that where they didn't eat dinner and then they went to bed and they didn't eat breakfast and they didn't eat lunch and then they would resume with dinner the next night and they would spend that time in prayer that they would have spent eating. And those are total fasts. We're giving up all food. Uh, Daniel uh, has many demands on him. He is a significant leader in the kingdom. He can't just take a 21-day break. Uh, he, he doesn't have the authority or the right to do that and so he's still going to have to function. And I promise you, you go 21 days without food, it will influence how much strength you have and how efficient you feel. In fact, uh, how many uh, here today, uh, 21 minutes is a long time to go without food. So it's 21 days. And so he, he altered his diet. So he, he took out the desserts and he took out the meat and, and uh, uh, he took out the wine and he just said, for 21 days, I'm going to focus my prayer and uh, I still have to be responsible for my duties, but I'm going to focus in prayer. And uh, th what we have to understand is that this practice is not intended to be a hunger strike. Trust me, if you go to God and you say, I'm not going to eat until you do this, uh, he will see you in about 50 days. Uh, you, it's, it's not a hunger strike. That's not the purpose. It is a way to humble ourselves. And if you've ever done this, it is very humbling. Uh, it is astonishing how much our life revolves around food. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big eater. In fact, I only eat one meal a day. I start when I get up. <laughs> and, and I go, I'm one of those grazers. Is there anybody else like me in the place? You, know, just kinda, you don't really eat a lot at once, but you just eat all the time. Just, I never go by a counter. If there's something on the counter, I just snack some, you know, just uh, even 20 minutes before dinner. Like, Sue is, is cooking stuff on the stove, and I'll go over the pantry and open it. She said, There'll be food in 20 minutes. I know. She said, You won't be hungry. I said, I'm always hungry. You know, just kind of like that. But once you, you take that center of food out of your life, very humbling, you realize how much of your life revolves around it. And this is my observation. It's, it's painful. Uh, I don't just get hungry. I get frustrated. And I get impatient. Uh, what, what do they call it? Hangry? Does anybody else get that? Anger and hunger? You put them together, you get hangry. And it's astonishing. That I, I, I think this might be one of the most powerful benefits of fasting in our lives is that when we change our diet for a spiritual purpose or we eliminate a meal or even a day of, of food, things begin to surface that we didn't even realize were in our heart. And the purpose of God is not to surface them to go, yeah, that's why I can't answer that prayer for you. The purpose of God is to use this situation not only to answer the prayer, but to deal with some character issues and some attitudinal issues and some emotional issues that we need addressed in our life. It's a very powerful thing. So you can put uh, prayer on the menu. Now, relentless praying can actually also have some additional benefits, and that is it can heal your short-sightedness. Short-sightedness is the natural consequence we all have of kind of a short attention span when we're praying. Most of us only pray about what we need today, and Jesus told us to do that. We should. 
But what about things that God would like to do over the course of our lifetime or our children's lifetime or our grandchildren's lifetime? Can you imagine how powerful it would be if your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren benefited from your prayers? What a powerful thing that could be. Or our church family would benefit beyond our own actuarial lifespan. Or that our country, our nation, our world would benefit beyond the number of breaths and heartbeats that we, are, that we have. So prayer, relentless prayer can kind of heal that short-sightedness. The second thing is that it can clarify your priorities. We don't always want what God wants. Our will usually weighs in heavily on our prayers. And sometimes we'll just throw in and, and may your will be done at the end. But over time, in relentless prayer, we begin to see what God is at work doing and what he wants to accomplish. And this can be very powerful in clarifying our priorities to know what's more important. A lot of times we'll think this is the most important thing, and then we begin to realize God is going to do that, but he's not going to do that first. There's an even more important thing that he's doing. And then it will also purify our motives. Sometimes we want things that are not healthy for us. Or sometimes we want healthy things, but for wrong reasons. And prayer has a way of forcing that impurity to the surface. And God has a way of skimming that off and giving us wisdom and insight to walk into. So my question is, what are you praying for that will outlast your lifetime? If the only things we're praying for is just things that can happen today, maybe we're praying in too limited a fashion. What promises of God are so great that you would spend a lifetime praying for? What dreams are so breathtaking that you would spend a lifetime praying for? The question is, is there something or someone that you'd be willing to pray about for 21 days? If you started today, I think that puts you at February 4th. And, uh, and you don't have to alter your menu um, I'm going to be getting together uh, towards the end of January with 25 other leaders from across our state. And a lot of them are engaged in a, a, a fast of 21 days. And it's a Daniel fast. So it's beans and rice and vegetables. That's all they eat. And so because some of them are doing that, all of us have to eat that. And I just, I told them last year, I said, why don't you just go ahead and bring in some dessert and some meat for the rest of us, and then, then maybe it will be even more spiritual if you have to sit there and watch us eat it. <laughs> but no, that's not what they're going to do. But for 21 days, is there something that you would devote 21 days? Is there a loved one? Is there a situation? Is there a relationship? Is there a concern? That for the next 21 days you would relentlessly pray. That you might add some body language to your prayer language. That you might even put food on the menu. Or I'm sorry, put prayer on the menu. And that might mean exchanging out prayer for something that you enjoy eating. Uh, this is what I will tell you. Don't be afraid to ask boldly. Secondly, Remember that the reason God answers our prayers is not because we are good, but because he is good. I believe that God wants to use our prayers to bring his will into our world. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, there are things that frustrate us day after day. But we often do not convert them to prayers. We just complain. There are things that we are afraid of from day to day. We often do not convert them to prayers. We just avoid. Would you help us pray? Would you help us pray relentless prayers? Prayers that refuse to give up on your best in our lives and those that we love and prayers that refuse to give in to our fears. We trust you. We trust that you hear every word that comes from our lips. 
and we trust that you will do the right thing. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning.